A monument sitting near the Abbeville County Courthouse is a source of pride to county residents, especially to Jeannie Milford. The monument honors Major Thomas Howey, the Major of St. Lowe. Jeannie Milford was Howie's sister-in-law. What does it mean to you for this monument to be here and his memory to be preserved in this way? Makes me very proud that I was part of the family. Thomas Howie was a standout student athlete at the Citadel. Only a fraction of a percentage point kept him from being a Rhodes Scholar. On D-Day, Major Howie landed at Omaha Beach with the Army's 29th Division. He would silence German machine gun nests single-handedly, the safety of his men always his main concern. On July 17, 1944, Howie was leading a battalion of the 116th Infantry Regiment on the outskirts of St. Lowe, France, when a German barrage began. And they were being bombarded. And he stood there and turned around and see that all of his men were safe. And then he was hit. And he said, my God, I'm hit. And he went down. His men loved him. They were very upset and everything. And they... Uh, took his body and put it in an ambulance first and started in to St. Lowe. But they needed the ambulance for wounded, so they took his body out of the ambulance, put it on the front of a Jeep, as some of the pictures I've shown you, and took the Jeep in, laid his body on the rubble of Saint, uh, Church of St. Croix, and passed in review while they were being fired at. Howie's memory inspired American troops in a crushing attack that liberated the city. Howie's dedication and leadership did not go unnoticed. This painting of his body being brought into St. Lowe is at the Citadel. Howie's story was a 1950s made-for-television movie on the DuPont Cavalcade Theater. I got until I'm hit. This monument in Abbeville isn't the only one honoring Thomas Howie. Another stands in St. Lowe, France, simply inscribed, the Major of St. Lowe. The final resting place for the Major of St. Lowe was a U.S. military cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach. There was never any attempt by his family to bring the body back to Abbeville. It was their feeling that even in death, he belonged among his beloved troops. Articles and pictures of the Major of St. Lowe are prized collections at the Abbeville County Library. Major Howie's Citadel portrait hangs in that library as well. Lasting tributes to a soldier a South Carolina native son who gave his life in the name of freedom. In Abbeville, Tom Crabtree, News Channel 7. He was a courageous leader and hero in World War II. He's been immor immortalized both in the upstate and in France. Tomorrow marks the 60th anniversary of the death of Thomas Howey of Abbeville, who to this day is known as the Major of St. Lowe. Major Howey was killed on July 17, 1944, as he led his troops to liberate St. Lowe from the Nazis. A decade ago, photojournalist Tommy Colonis and I brought you the story of how the French revere Major Howey. During last month's 60th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, American veterans and grateful Frenchmen gathered again in Howie's memory, and Tommy Colonis caught the moment on tape. Join us for that tribute to an upstate hero tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock on News Channel 7 Saturday. Well, coming up, a French town is celebrating a brave upstate soldier from World War II this weekend. Find out why they still remember him 60 years after he died. That story is coming up in about 10 minutes. Stay with us. A French town is celebrating the life of an upstate war hero today. Find out why, 60 years after he died, his bravery has not been forgotten. News Channel 7's Tom Crabtree has that story when we come back. There may be a lot of friction right now in America's relationship with France, but in the town of St. Lowe, there are only warm memories of an upstate soldier who was part of the greatest generation. A decade ago, News Channel 7's Tom Crabtree traveled to France with photojournalist Tom Colonis to bring us the story of his sacrifice to liberate that French city during World War II. Today, with new video just shot in France last month, they're retelling this story of the Major of St. Lo. In the city of St. Lo, the French hold a reunion with veterans of the U.S. Army's 29th Division, who 60 years earlier drove the Nazis out of St. Lowe. The 
the stories of World War II are told again and again. No name is mentioned more than that of an Abbeville native and Citadel graduate honored with this memorial, Thomas Dry Howie, forever known as the Major of St. Lo. The small farming town west of Paris was such a vital transportation hub, Adolf Hitler ordered German troops to hold it at all costs. Howie wanted his troops to be the first Americans in St. Lo. On July 17, 1944, his battalion was within a mile of the city, ready to attack when a German mortar barrage began. Peter Graves portrayed Major Howie in this DuPont Cavalcade theater production. I got until I'm hit. News of Howie's death bolstered his men for the fierce battle ahead. As his battalion entered the city, Howie's troops placed the body of their beloved Major on the hood of the lead jeep. He was the first soldier into St. Lo. His flag-draped body was then placed on the rubble of a church. Back in the upstate, there is a monument to Howie in the Abbeville Town Square. It has the inscription, dead in France, deathless in fame. Thomas Howie hasn't been forgotten by the people of the French city he helped liberate or by his native South Carolina. Just last year, he was inducted into the State Hall of Fame. Howie was laid to rest in the Omaha Beach Cemetery. And each day in St. Lo, grateful Frenchmen pass by this memorial to the city's greatest hero, the Major of St. Lo. Tom Crabtree, News Channel 7. Today is the 60th anniversary of Major Howie's death, and the city of St. Lo is holding a special ceremony celebrating what he did for that city, the bravery of the Major of St. Lo. Pete? Will the Braves remain in first?
other city workers. Way to our next stop is Lake Harbor. One of you been to Abbeville? Uh, Tommy's been here several times. Abby. It's my first trip yeah. back. bit for 13. figure out how and then I'll put all
Bob Slaughter, who saw his company commander killed on Omaha Beach, lost another trusted officer on the push inland towards St. Lowe. Major Tom Howie had promised his men he would see them when they liberated the town. He was killed by a mortar shell shrapnel, hit him in the chest. And General Gerhardt, the 29th Division commanding officer, uh, he said, well, we're going to make, see, make sure that Tom gets to St. Lowe. So he propped him up in a jeep, and he took him into St. Lowe, and at the only church halfway standing when we got there, they laid him in state there on a pile of rubble and put an American flag over it. All it was terrible. It's hardly a day that goes by that you don't think about it. The sky was just lighted just like it would be with, with fireworks. War is hell, and it was hell. Somebody had to do it, and uh, I always liked action. June 6th, 1944, the greatest invasion in history. D-Day, the liberation of Nazi-occupied France. I'm Tom Crabtree reporting from Omaha Beach in Normandy, France. Join me Monday night for D-Day, Carolina Liberators. Good evening, I'm Tom Crabtree reporting to you on this 50th anniversary of D-Day from Omaha Beach in France. Our report tonight will take us to the beaches of Normandy, to England, and to the Carolinas for the story of D-Day, Carolina Liberators. Hours before Allied troops began landing at the five Normandy beachheads, other soldiers were making drops behind enemy lines, an airborne attack. A member of that airborne group went on to become one of South Carolina's most famous politicians. Another member, a Georgia man, is reenacting that historic jump 50 years later. I would go like this, and then the person would answer. Or we would give one, and then he'd give one back, and then I'd answer with a one, you see. Clickers, also called crickets, were used by paratroopers on D-Day to find fellow soldiers in the dark. Bob Dunning was one of those airborne troops. He still has the boots and pants that he wore 50 years ago when he parachuted with the 101st Airborne Division near the French village of St. Mary Glise. At age 73, he's still airborne all the way and still makes jumps. And over here, these are Dutch wings. When we jumped in Holland, they gave us the Dutch wings. When I come back from Normandy this time, then I'll have to put another set of wings on, which will be French. This June 6th, Dunning will be among 14 D-Day veterans, members of the Return to Normandy Foundation, going back to St. Mary Glees to parachute again as part of the 50th anniversary observance. In 1944, close to 23,000 Allied soldiers dropped behind German lines to capture or destroy guns and bridges, disrupt German communications, keep Nazi reinforcements from reaching the beaches where liberators were landing. Many of the airborne invaders were either killed as they landed by German troops or drowned under the weight of their equipment in fields the enemy had flooded. Dunning landed in water. After perilous moments, he was able to get out. I landed in this water, and I was underwater, so I got into my boot, and we had a boot knife, and I took my knife out, and I stuck it in the ground, and I started working with my, in, in the bottom of the water, and I'm holding my breath, hoping I could live. The airborne invasion force also included South Carolina's Strom Thurmond, then a member of the 82nd Airborne, now a U.S. Senator. Thurmond was in one of the nearly 900 gliders that silently brought in Allied troops and we landed in an apple orchard. And fortunately, uh, the plane landed between two apple rows. And uh, by the time, uh, I mean the glider, by the time it stopped, though, it was uh, torn up. We didn't have to open any doors or do anything. Oh, we just stepped out. My forehead was injured, my knee was injured, and my hand was injured, and I was bleeding. So uh, the person that met us took us immediately to the doctor, and we got treatment at the doctor, and then, and then we went into action with uh, the 82nd. The day America declared war on Germany, Circuit Judge Strom Thurmond joined the Army and later volunteered for the D-Day Glider Force. Well, somebody had to do it, and uh, I always liked action. As Bob Dunning makes the reenactment jump on June 6th, 
he'll be wearing this duplicate of his original uniform. And he'll honor four friends, now deceased, who were part of the airborne invasion by yelling out their names. Ronnie Ronzoni, another friend he remembers only as Abby. Both of them died in Normandy. Sky Jackson, who passed away last year. And then Colonel Wolverton, which was our battalion commander at that time, he was killed before he hit the ground. Still being able 50 years later to get into a uniform and go over there to do that, I think it's a great honor for me. And it's, it's something that uh, I, I know I'll never forget. And I want to say this, I want, I want everybody to come back around the next 50 years, and I hope I'm here then, too, to do it, you see? Today in St. Mary Glees, a stained glass window inside this Norman church shows reverence to the town's two saviors, baby Jesus held by his mother Mary, and American paratroopers from the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. Outside the church, on a parachute hanging from the steeple, a tribute to the most famous of those D-Day paratroopers who landed in the town square, Private John Steele who saved his life by playing dead for two hours until Germans cut him down and took him prisoner. D-Day is the town's biggest historic event. And on this 50th anniversary of the invasion, there are flags, caricatures of American troops, airborne insignias, augmenting the town's permanent tributes to the soldiers who drove out the Nazis and made the town free. Other soldiers from the Carolinas were guiding ships and planes on D-Day, giving support to those who were attacking from the beaches. It wasn't frightening, uh, it was exciting, it was very serious, and uh, we took our jobs very responsibly, and uh, just glad that I wasn't on the ground. <laughs> you, you felt lucky to be in the air. I felt lucky to be in the air, right. Joe Conklin of Gaffney was flying reconnaissance on D-Day. His orders were to look for German troop movements and not get into an aerial fight. German flyers had different plans. Uh, they tangled with me, and uh, I had to get home, so I had to shoot one of them down. And uh, then I ran into another one and shot him down, too. Conklin is a charter member of the Spartanburg-based Warbirds Group, an aviation history organization with a special interest in World War II. Historic aircraft are displayed each year as part of Spartanburg's spring fling. My ride in this vintage SNJ-6 trainer fighter was like stepping back into history. Ed Wolcott was also a D-Day pilot. His mementos include this picture of his C-47 transport plane that he'd nicknamed Pam after his British girlfriend. That's Pam here on the left. And this photo of Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight Eisenhower, snapped by Wolcott as the general talked with pilots the evening before the invasion. They said not to bring any cameras, but I had one in my pocket and I pulled it out and snapped a real quick one. <laughs> well, nobody, nobody saw me, I don't think. Everyone was looking at Ike. Wolcott's early morning mission to Normandy meant flying without lights, avoiding German radar by flying only a few feet above the ocean. Then he delivered paratroopers from the 82nd Airborne behind enemy lines. And they dropped paratroopers ahead of time, and they set up these flares in a big X wherever they want you to drop. So our X was right there, and we, we dropped everything right on there, and we turn on the green light, and everybody gets up and hooks up, and they're right there. They're ready to go. Then you uh, turn on the red light, and they're gone. You know, by the time you turn around from looking, from looking to switch, the last guy's going out. This is what we've been waiting on. That's what we were told over the intercom on the ship, that that's what we've been waiting on during these last few months. And this is the, the day. The Allied Naval Force on D-Day was the greatest armada ever assembled. Nearly 5,000 ships, ranging from great battleships to small landing craft for the beach assaults. First, the great guns of the fleet softened up the German shore batteries. The massive naval operation included the destroyer USS Schubrick. On board was 21-year-old gun captain Ben Hardin, a Kings Mountain, North Carolina native who later made Spartanburg his home. The Schubrick's main job on D-Day was to sail up and down the five Normandy beachheads, primarily Omaha, and be a guinea pig, trying to draw fire from German guns so that the cruisers and the battleships that were sitting back beyond us could drop their fire in and they were, we were spotting the shore batteries. The sky was just lighted just like it would be with, with fireworks. The paratroopers were coming in, the gliders were coming in, 
and everything was just, and then the, the fire from the ships and so forth, it just lighted up the whole beaches. Ben Hardin carries another D-Day memory, a good luck memory for him, the cruel hand of fate for another ship. You could only use 60% of your ammunition, and then you had to go back out and reload. We went into Plymouth, England at 3 o'clock. We had to leave there at 3 o'clock our position on D-Day afternoon. When we come back to take our turn back, the ship that relieved us had already been sank. It was sitting with the bow up in the air. Ben Hardin is going back to Normandy for this 50th anniversary of D-Day. He's been invited to be aboard the USS aircraft carrier George Washington and go back to the D-Day location this time as part of an armada for peace. D-Day Carolina Liberators will return in just a moment. We used to say we were like boxers, gradually coming up to the big one, the championship. You know, each boat is a little bit forward towards the great act when you're going to try for that. An OK blow, and this was it. On June 6, 1944, Charles Simpson was lieutenant commander of the heavy cruiser HMS Belfast. Today, the Belfast is a tourist attraction, permanently moored on the Thames River in London. Off Juno Beach on D-Day, at precisely 5.30 a.m., the Belfast fired the first salvo against German shore guns and kept firing until Allied troops started hitting the beaches. There were 12 six-inch guns in four triple turrets, and the instruction was to fire broadsides. So these 12 guns went off simultaneously, and the whole ship would have vibrated and trembled and jumped to it. Um, you know, that's a mighty a lot of guns to go off. Uh, they put out of action an extremely strong uh, gun emplacement, on which could have been a very great deal of trouble. I, I, knew, that, I knew that it was going to be a bad day. It was going to be a bad day, and I was hoping that I would get through it, and I was hoping that the rest of them would get through it. Joe Brignolo survived bloody Omaha, the beach where 2,000 American troops lost their lives on D-Day. As British, Canadian, and French troops hit gold, Juno, and sword beaches, American troops attacked Omaha and Utah. Brignolo never pointed a weapon. He pointed a camera. A professional photographer today, Brignolo was a combat photographer on D-Day, capturing the horrible scenes of Omaha Beach on film. Every once in a while, you'd turn around to see what was happening. And then you got the scene of all these boats and the people coming up, and this was, this was very strong. Bernie Schwartz's anti-tank company landed on Omaha two days after D-Day. When we landed on that beach, we saw bodies and the uh, medical men coming, coming off the beach and up on the hills, who were just going back to taking the, the dead and the wounded, the wounded mostly, bringing them back to, to ships you know, uh, that were waiting for them, the medical ships. Hank Klim's infantry unit hit Utah Beach, where German resistance was light. The landing, though off target, a big success. We, we met resistance, and, uh, the, uh, and I guess fortunately that we were on the wrong beach, maybe uh, we'd have had, uh, you know, a, a tougher time of it. Of course, we eventually had to slide, you know, a parallel to the beach to get where we were supposed to go to hit our, our you know, checkpoints and so forth. Joe Brignolo's photography career that began in war has since taken him around the world nearly 60 times to 150 countries. But he still cherishes his army jacket, prints of some of his army photos. He says no assignment will ever mean more than Omaha Beach. If you don't grow up then during that period of time, which I did, I mean, we're all kids and, you know, young and, and not too smart and not too savvy, but <clears throat> You, you grow up and you grow up fast during this situation or you don't survive. It's, it's that simple. Point de Ho, between Omaha and Utah beaches, was where Rudder's Rangers scaled 100-foot high cliffs under intense German fire to attack gun emplacements. Out of 225 Rangers, only 90 were left to fight at day's end. Fifty years later, some say Point de Ho resembles the moon. Massive craters carved by Allied naval guns still dot the landscape. German pillboxes, some still intact, did not contain the big guns the Rangers were sent to destroy. The guns were later found about two miles inland 
and captured. The invasion was planned and its progress followed at Southwark House in Portsmouth, England. It was supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force. The invasion map is still in place, just as it was 50 years ago. Aubrey Ellis was a member of the Royal Marines, a sentry at Southwark House, and witnessed General Dwight Eisenhower make a crucial decision to delay the invasion one day because of bad weather. They were receiving weather reports all the time. And then um, General, Eisenhower, <coughs> General Eisenhower turned to Admiral Ramsey and said, we, we must delay for 25, 24 hours, which made D-Day June 6th. Mary Verrier is a tour guide at Southwark House now. On D-Day, she was a Red Cross nurse, treating the first D-Day casualties brought back to England. I don't think we were quite prepared for the total number of casualties that were coming or the state in which the men were. Uh, I was very young and we were trained to, I was a burns unit. The state of some of the chaps and the burns was quite horrific. A lot, terrible lot of eye injuries. And the men, of course, were tired and exhausted. The sand was a problem to get out of their wounds and things like that. D-Day, Carolina Liberators will return in just a moment. The American cemetery at Omaha Beach is the final resting place for nearly 9,400 American soldiers who fought in Europe. Duncan of South Carolina, Wyatt of North Carolina, Hodges of Georgia. The perfect rows of white headstones, like soldiers at attention. The sounds of war replaced by the silent reverence of eternal rest. I tend to wonder what they were feeling, um, hearing that gunfire on the ships right before they drop the doors and, and are completely exposed to it. It's hard to talk about. It is. Busload after busload of veterans, family and visitors, come to see, to imagine, to pay respects. It's a uh, reflective expression. Uh, they're with their thoughts. Uh, you know, looking out at those white headstones, uh, even though uh, one is triumphant war, uh, it's still a tragedy, as we do have losses. And uh, I think a lot of that's running through their heads. Among the thousands of brave soldiers buried here at the Omaha Beach Cemetery is a South Carolinian, considered a hero both in his native Abbeville and in St. Lowe, France, Major Thomas Howie, the Major of St. Lowe. A monument sitting near the Abbeville County Courthouse is a source of pride to county residents, especially to Jeannie Milford. The monument honors Major Thomas Howie, the Major of St. Lowe. Jeannie Milford was Howie's sister-in-law. What does it mean to you for this monument to be here and his memory to be preserved in this way? Makes me very proud that I was part of the family. Thomas Howie was a standout student athlete at the Citadel. Only a fraction of a percentage point kept him from being a Rhodes Scholar. On D-Day, Major Howie landed at Omaha Beach with the Army's 29th Division. He would silence German machine gun nests single-handedly, the safety of his men always his main concern. On July 17, 1944, Howie was leading a battalion of the 116th Infantry Regiment on the outskirts of St. Lowe, France, when a German barrage began. And they were being bombarded. And he stood there and turned around and see that all of his men were safe. And then he was hit. And he said, my God, I'm hit. And he went down. His men loved him. They were very upset and everything. And they uh, took his body and put it in an ambulance first and started in to St. Lowe. But they needed the ambulance for wounded. So they took his body out of the ambulance, put it on the front of a Jeep. There's some of the pictures I've shown you. And took the Jeep in laid his body on the rubble of Saint, uh, Church of St. Croix and passed in review while they were being fired at. Howie's memory inspired American troops in a crushing attack that liberated the city. Howie's dedication and leadership did not go unnoticed. This painting of his body being brought into St. Lowe is at the Citadel. 
Howie's Story was a 1950s made-for-television movie on the DuPont Cavalcade Theater. I got till I'm hit. Articles and pictures of the Major of St. Lowe are prized collections at the Abbeville County Library. Major Howie's Citadel portrait hangs in that library as well. Lasting tributes to a soldier, a South Carolina native son who gave his life in the name of freedom. And without the, the American, we would be speaking German today. You really believe that? Oh, certainly. The American just, uh, you know, the, the French people are forever grateful. A native of St. Lowe who married an American. Jocelyn Smith was a six-year-old when U.S. troops drove out the Nazis. She remembers the food provided by Americans was sometimes the only meal of the day. Every morning in school, if it hadn't been for those army biscuits, we call those biscuits, they were cookies actually, milk cookies. If we didn't have that to start the day, it was full of vitamins, we had nothing the rest of the day. We would boil grass, we would, you know, whatever we could eat. Saint-Lô was the end of uh, an important battle called uh, the Edge Row Battle. Uh, the 29th Division had a uh, lot of casualties be between Omaha Beach and Saint-Lô. Reminders of those horrid days have been preserved. The remains of a prison are now a memorial to Saint-Lô residents executed by the Nazis and those who died in labor camps. Shacks like this one being readied for display were the only homes available after bombing practically leveled the city. Now St. Lo is a vibrant local government center, and the city is putting on its best face for the returning liberators. When we came through here in 1944, this city was in a shambles. I had never seen anything in as, as rubble, as, this, as much rubble as this was. So to come back here after 50 years and see this vibrant locality is really something. And these people here in, in Normandy are really desirous to see the Americans. They really think we're top dog. In many ways, the citizens of St. Lowe, France, have paid tribute to the American soldiers who liberated their village from the Nazis in 1944. Among those tributes, a permanent memorial to Major Thomas Howey, the Major of St. Lowe. D-Day Carolina Liberators will return in just a moment. These are just a few of the stories of D-Day. The 50th anniversary makes this observance special as a news event. But the veterans of D-Day and the grateful people of France will tell you that D-Day changed their lives forever, made every day special, every day a day of freedom. I'm Tom Crabtree reporting from Omaha Beach, France. Thank you for joining us tonight for D-Day, Carolina Liberators. Emmy Award-winning News Channel 7 is next. And our special celebration and remembrance of the 50th anniversary of D-Day continues with a special photo essay of a day to remember. And finally tonight, this has been a day of emotion, of history, and of memories from a long time ago when the world stood at the brink of disaster, only to be placed instead on the road to freedom and democracy. This was also a day of images captured on videotape, images that will last a lifetime. News Channel 7 photographer, editor Tommy Colonis brings us a small portion of those images of Normandy, 1994, 50 years after D-Day. Ici, Londres. 
Les Français parlent aux Français. Voici notre huitième bulletin d'information. I knew there was going to be a bad day. It was going to be a bad day, and I was hoping that I would get through it, and I was hoping that the rest of it would get through it. From the battleships and the cruisers, uh, the, the, the guns going off constantly and the planes flying overhead. The paratroopers were coming in, the gliders were coming in, and everything was just, and then the, the fire from the ships and so forth, it just lighted up the whole beaches. <laughs> Thank you. That's a group of veterans who jumped this afternoon. And while the young guys showed how it's done now, it was the 41 veterans, many of whom were a part of the real thing, who stole the show. We left our youth here 50 years ago, so I came back to retrieve it. We gather in the calm after sunrise today to remember that fateful morning. The pivot point of the war, perhaps the pivot point of the 20th century. but was secured through the sacrifice of those who shared their youth and lifeblood to defend and give heart to a nation. As on this day, we offer our profound gratitude for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life, so that we may keep faith with those who have gone before us and acquit ourselves with honor as we take the torch of freedom into tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Amen. Of course, uh, Tommy Colonus, who put that piece together, and myself, we spent uh, a week in uh, England and in Normandy, France, uh, seeing these uh, sites for ourselves. We'll share that with you in a special report coming up at 7.30 tonight. We hope you'll join us for that. Should be a special report, Tom. Very good. He was a courageous leader and hero in World War II. He's been immor immortalized both in the upstate and in France. Tomorrow marks the 60th anniversary of the death of Thomas Howie of Abbeville, who to this day is known as the Major of St. Lo. Major Howie was killed on July 17, 1944, as he led his troops to liberate St. Lo from the Nazis. A decade ago, photojournalist Tommy Colonis and I brought you the story of how the French revere Major Howie, during last month's 60th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, American veterans and grateful Frenchmen gathered again in Howie's memory, and Tommy Colonis caught the moment on tape. Join us for that tribute to an upstate hero tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock on News Channel 7 Saturday. Well, coming up, a French town is celebrating a brave upstate soldier from World War II this weekend. Find out why they still remember him 60 years after he died. That story is coming up in about 10 minutes. Stay with us. A French town is celebrating the life of an upstate war hero today. Find out why, 60 years after he died, his bravery has not been forgotten. News Channel 7's Tom Crabtree has that story when we come back. There may be a lot of friction right now in America's relationship with France, but in the town of St. Lo, there are only warm memories of an upstate soldier who was part of the greatest generation. A decade ago, News Channel 7's Tom Crabtree traveled to France with photojournalist Tom Colonis to bring us the story of his sacrifice to liberate that French city during World War II. Today, with new video just shot in France last month, they're retelling this story of the Major of St. Lo. In the city of St. Lo, the French hold a reunion with veterans of the U.S. Army's 29th Division, who 60 years earlier drove the Nazis out of St. Lo.
The stories of World War II are told again and again. No name is mentioned more than that of an Abbeville native and Citadel graduate honored with this memorial, Thomas Dry Howey, forever known as the Major of St. Lowe. The small farming town west of Paris was such a vital transportation hub, Adolf Hitler ordered German troops to hold it at all costs. Howey wanted his troops to be the first Americans in St. Lowe. On July 17, 1944, his battalion was within a mile of the city, ready to attack when a German mortar barrage began. Peter Graves portrayed Major Howey in this DuPont Cavalcade Theater production. I got till I'm hit. News of Howey's death bolstered his men for the fierce battle ahead. As his battalion entered the city, Howey's troops placed the body of their beloved Major on the hood of the lead jeep. He was the first soldier into St. Lo. His flag-draped body was then placed on the rubble of a church. Back in the upstate, there is a monument to Howey in the Abbeville Town Square. It has the inscription, dead in France, deathless in fame. Thomas Howey hasn't been forgotten by the people of the French city he helped liberate or by his native South Carolina. Just last year, he was inducted into the State Hall of Fame. Howey was laid to rest in the Omaha Beach Cemetery. And each day in St. Lo, grateful Frenchmen pass by this memorial to the city's greatest hero, the Major of St. Lo. Tom Crabtree, News Channel 7. Today is the 60th anniversary of Major Howey's death, and the city of St. Lo is holding a special ceremony celebrating what he did for that city, the bravery of the Major of St. Lo. Pete? You're watching the area's most watched weekend newscast, News Channel 7. Who's happening about the comet? So, Good Jim, deal. thank you very much. Fifty years ago today, Americans were fighting a campaign to liberate France on the beaches of Normandy. A man from Abbey, Major Thomas Howey, was a member of the 29th Division fighting in that campaign. Howey was killed in the operation. His men draped his body with an American flag and carried it into the city on their way to free the village from Nazi control. The French were so grateful they erected a statue in Abbeville and in France. Well, today, hundreds of veterans, family and friends gathered at the Abbeville Courthouse to lay a wreath in honor of Howey's memorial. It's very gratifying to me to know that the people in the town where he grew up still have this wonderful feeling about him and his accomplishments and uh, his character and it's always a pleasure for me to come to Abbeville. It's a wonderful place. The French held their own ceremony to honor Howie today in San Lo and straight ahead in News Channel 7 Sports, the final day of the World Cup. Can you believe it? Fred has the championship game from the Rose Bowl and just a little bit later. Is it Freedom Weekend Aloft all over again? We'll tell you next on the News Channel. Bob Slaughter, who saw his company commander killed on Omaha Beach, lost another trusted officer on the push inland towards St. Lo. Major Tom Howey had promised his men he would see them when they liberated the town. He was killed by a motorcycle shrapnel, hit him in the chest. And General Gerhardt, the 29th Division commanding officer, uh, he said, well, we're going to make, see, make sure that Tom gets to St. Lowe. So he propped him up in a jeep, and he took him into St. Lowe, and it's the only church halfway standing when we got there. They laid him in state there on a the pile of rubble and put an American flag over it. All of it was terrible. That's hardly a day that goes by that you don't think about it.
Why the children today? What does that mean? Because we're passing on our tradition to them and what we saw on D-Day and all and beyond. We have to let the young generation know what we went through and not ever let it happen again. And that's why it must not ever happen again. Back then, people were raised to protect what they believed in, and he believed in the freedom. A Carolina hero who gave his life, remembering the day he saved an entire town at six. You're a hero one day and history the next day. Over there, he's been a hero for 60 years. Her father saved an entire town and the people there will not forget. A special anniversary for a Carolina veteran. Next. He is a hero to an entire town. How a Carolina veteran saved a village in France from the Nazi war machine. That's coming up next. Recently I brought you the story of the Major of St. Lowe, a Carolinian who gave his life in the liberation of France in World War II. Tonight, another brave Carolinian is remembered. Because of his heroism, on this day, 60 years ago, he is known as the savior of Mayenne. Photojournalist Tommy Colonis and I relived that story with this hero's daughter in Charlotte. But it was something he wanted to do in the, from the heart. Myrtis Maness tells me this painting has been in her family since 1947, a gift from the people of Mayenne, France. <laughs> so, so what do you think of as you look at this painting? Uh, what, what thoughts come to mind? That it was a very beautiful town, a very beautiful town. A town that you're glad was saved? Mm-hmm, very much so. Saved by her late father, Private James McRacken, who grew up in Red Springs, North Carolina, south of Fayetteville. August 5th, 1944, the German army had destroyed two of Mayenne's three stone bridges and wired the remaining bridge for demolition. Had that bridge been destroyed, the town would likely have been bombarded by the Allies to get the Germans out. Alva Lumpkin of Columbia, a World War II sergeant and former state representative, remembers the scenario. If they had kept that bridge, if they had blown that bridge up, we, we, would, we would have been stopped. Task Force Weaver would have been stopped. Private McRacken somehow ran 500 yards to the bridge. He cut the wires to the explosives, but fell dead. They don't know how he lived to get there and cut the wires because it was all completely open. And I just knew every moment I was running on that bridge that thing was going to blow. And there I went, poof, up in the air as a piece of dust. But no, it didn't blow. Thank goodness. As American troops poured in, grateful citizens covered McCracken's body with flowers and never forgot the man they called the savior of their town. In 1961, citizens of Charlotte, North Carolina, collected money for Manus and her mother to visit Mayenne. Walking down the street, the older people were saying they would say merci as you went by, thank you. And Manus was given this doll that the French modeled after one of her photographs. In terms of the many possessions you have accumulated over the years, mm -hmm. where does this one rank? Yep, right up there with the picture. <laughs> one and two. <laughs> That's the only that they're the they're my legacy mm -hmm. from my daddy in a roundabout way. Yeah. Red Springs remembers its brave native son with this memorial, and Mayenne remembers him with this plaque on the bridge where he gave his life and saved the town. Do you, in fact, have dreams of going back to the city, back to Mayenne someday? Oh, I'd love to go back. I'd love to go back. What would you do if you go back? Just to go see the people again. I, I'm older now. It would mean more, I think. And this added note, we've learned that when the United States was attacked on 9-11, the citizens of Mayenne, France, gathered on the bridge that Carolinian James McCracken saved in a show of solidarity with America. Will Murtis Manus ever return to Mayenne? We'll stay in touch with her. We'll find out. We hope so. Mm -hmm. Very interesting story. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Tom. On this day, a special kinship between the Carolinas and a town in France is celebrated. A kinship that goes back 60 years, the day an American soldier saved the town from certain annihilation. Private James McRacken, who grew up in Red Springs, North Carolina, near Fayetteville, is remembered as the savior of Mayenne, 
On this day in 1944, McCracken made a 500-yard dash in the face of German fire and cut the wires to German explosives. He kept Mayenne's last bridge from being destroyed, but lost his life. Had the bridge not been saved, the Allies would have bombed the town to dislodge the German army. Murtis Manus of Charlotte is the late hero's daughter. Grateful French gave her a doll and gave her family this painting of Mayenne. What do you think of <laughs> as you look at this painting? Uh, what, what thoughts come to mind? That it was a very beautiful town. A very beautiful town. A town that you're glad was saved? Mm hmm. Very much so. In 1961, citizens of Charlotte raised money so Manus and her mother could visit Mayenne. She says the French received them warmly with great appreciation for her father's sacrifice. Someday she hopes to visit the town again.